Hello, my name is Whitney Molesby, and this is my final presentation on English in the British Isles. I want to read you, first of all, a quote that describes English as a lingua franca. I absolutely love this quote. Languages are living things, and just like human beings, they go through the processes of birth, growth, change, and death. These natural processes occur with the passage of years, decades, and centuries. Of a Germanic origin, English has gone through such stages of change over centuries, and today it holds an unprecedentedly strong status all around the world. The spread of English gained momentum, especially with the rise of the USA at economic, technological, and political levels. Thus, it has gradually become spoken by so many different circles and gained the lingua franca status. I want to talk a little bit about how English was first introduced to the area of the British Isles um, and when it was approximately introduced. Now, research is difficult to follow a little bit. There's some lack of awareness of the northern English dialects. Obviously, especially with a lot of history, we tend to hear most of our research from secondary sources. And a lot of researchers feel as if there's not enough information from smaller various communities and that it's kind of too generalized for the area. But I will share with you the content that seems to be pretty widely reported. So basically, um, you hear of a lot of Latin influence in the British Isles before English was kind of introduced. And then in 450 AD, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes settled in Britain and they came over from the Northwest European continent. They brought with them some Western Germanic dialects. Obviously, um, this was a geographical move, but also a political move. And so a lot of times you will see that the Angles and Saxons and Jutes had different reasons for bringing over the language. This time period was known as the beginning of Old English. And by the year 600, the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes had really established their power in Britain and Old English had really taken a stronghold. Then about 1066, a French duke invaded Britain and brought with him some of his higher-powered individuals like clergymen and um, government officials. And obviously, if he brought them with, those individuals would speak French. But during that time, Old English was still spoken in Britain. And so we had a lot of mixing and matching of the language. And this is where our history so shows a huge influence from the French language because the upper class individuals would have been speaking French, the lower class individuals would have been speaking Old English, they would have needed to communicate, and so we start to establish kind of a mixed language, and this was known as the Middle English era. So moving into the 16th and 17th centuries, a lot of things happen. We first noticed a great vowel shift, which was a change in our pronunciations. Our vowels went from being pronounced kind of in the back of our mouths and our throats toward the front with the tip of our tongue and our lips, which obviously changed a lot of how our English sounded. After this time, we maybe can recognize how those people were speaking a little bit more. Um, we also see a lot of commercial value in learning languages like Italian, Spanish, Dutch, and German. Um, a lot of times if, if some sort of individual was in power in that country, they encouraged people to speak their language as well. Um, educated individuals started to learn a little bit more French and a little more German, and this even survived throughout the World Wars. Um, you see that the printing press sped up language progression and helped standardize English a little bit. In the 18th century, we see a lot of vocabulary changes due to the wars, due to the expansion of the British Empire and some technological advances. And then, like I said, educated individuals were really expected to learn both French and German in addition to English. And then it's interesting, but by 2001, things switch a little bit and Spanish takes over as the second language. Now we'll take a look at where this falls in Catru's three-circle model of Englishes, 
And according to 2014 data in Galloway and Rose, the UK is in the inner circle with 63,705,000 English speakers. Now we can take a quick look at where this falls within Schneider's dynamic model by looking at the phases. So phase one is the foundation, which would be when English arrives to the region, done. Phase two, the exonormative stabilization, extensive use of English within the area, done. Phase three, nativization, language used by native English speakers is used alongside more indigenous one, check. Phase four, endonormative stabilization. The indigenous variety takes root and becomes widely accepted. Done. And then if you take a look at phase five differentiation, speakers of the indigenous variety take pride in their variety. So it's kind of unfair because we see that this is one of the older areas for English to exist, but obviously in the British Isles, Schneider's dynamic model, Britain has reached all of those phases successfully. I found an excellent quote by Tagliamonte to describe how English is viewed in the British Isles at this time, so I'm just going to go ahead and read that to you. Quote, Indeed, the variety spoken by the oldest generation of individuals in the outlying off-the-beaten-track locations lag far behind what is going on in the urban centers and mainstream populations of Britain. Features that are moribund or gone forever virtually everywhere in the world can be studied here. Yet it is astounding that the tracks of history endure so long. The unique socio-cultural milieu of the North has contributed a great deal to this extensive, long-term, socially ingrained maintenance. So as you can see, they view English in a positive way and are proud of their history, but also proud of how far it has come. Now we can take a look at some of the specific attitudes toward English. Modern times show a standard British to be more popular with the politics of the country, and then um, regional varieties tend to go with more of a pop culture popular type variety. The grammatical and syntactical variation does attract some negative judgment if it is used by people and they seem slightly uneducated. Obviously, geographical and social boundaries play a huge role in how someone speaks in that area and also even so socioeconomic status. Um, learners with more positive attitudes toward a specific variety are obviously more motivated to conform to it, but they run the risk of losing their own cultural identity. So hopefully we see people that are proud of their variety that continue to use their variety and that don't get lost too much in the quote-unquote standard English that is encouraged to speak in other places. Now it'll be interesting to take a look at the differences between American English that we're used to and the British English that would be spoken in the British Isles. Algeo says that the most obvious difference between the two is kind of the tune of the language or the intonation that is used when speaking long sentences. This is why people tend to find it harder to distinguish between British and American accents when they are singing because it has a lot to do with the tone of how they speak. Another interesting factor is that British English often uses the irregular T form of inflected verbs. So instead of saying burned, they say burnt. Or instead of saying dwelled, they say dwelt. Um, a passive present tense is sometimes used in British to talk about a current situation. Typically, Americans would use the present progressive, the present perfect, or a future tense. For example... Today, Anthony Caro is made a knight, when we would typically say, Anthony Caro is going to be made a knight today. Another interesting difference is that British verbs sometimes take a nominal complement, while Americans take a prepositional complement. For example, instead of, we agree on a plan, in American, you might say, agree a plan with a British dialect. Um, the specific subject of a sentence might be stated first in British English to emphasize the subject as the topic. For example, they might say, Doreen, she only works part-time down at the bedding shop. 
Another difference that I really didn't know about is in America, we say we're going to the store at 7.05, and we include that O sound, and in Britain, Britain, they say 7.05 and do not include the O sound. So a difference that would be seen more in writing would be that in American English, we separate the hours and minutes of time with a colon, and in British English, they separate with a period. So as you can see, there are a lot of differences. Um, some of the explanation of these differences might be that America has a lot more native speakers than Britain, and it's rapidly becoming the dominant form of English in a lot of those non-native countries. However, much of Europe kind of looks to Britain as their academic model and uses that for their academic standard. And then on the other end of that, a lot of people look to America as their pop culture standard. It was so wonderful to take a closer look at English in the British Isles because it's such a dynamic part of our history. Although we are from the United States, we have such a huge connection to that. And so it was a great way for me to see how our language has evolved from the very beginning. Changes in the English language are extremely dramatic and dynamic in their pace, movement, and impact. As we take a quick look into the past, we can only wonder more and more about the future. While the British Isles brought us our initial English language, we will influence our future language as a lingua franca.